it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Laura Clark. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, real privilege to be here. I always really enjoy visiting universities, talking to students, and of course, um, the reputation of the University of Canterbury goes before you. So it's great to be here and also to have had some time to to look around the campus a lot and see quite how much work has been done recently. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. So it's a privilege to be here. It's also an enormous privilege to be the British High Commissioner to New Zealand. It's always, I think, been the most fabulous job. The strength of our people to people links, the historical ties, the sporting and cultural links, the shared values, the, the same humour. But I think it's particularly interesting and important right now um, in terms of UK and New Zealand relations in a Brexit context, but also at a time of major global change. So I want to use my time to talk with you to talk a bit about Brexit negotiations and what it means and doesn't mean for the UK and the UK's relationship with Europe. Then I'll talk about the UK, about global Britain in the world, and then about the importance of the UK-New Zealand relationship in all of that. Um, and then, of course, most importantly, there will be time for conversation, for questions, and I'll be very happy to take questions on any topic, um, and also will happily talk about the merits of a career in diplomacy, about doing an OE in the UK, about studying in the UK. So I'm, I'm happy to sort of tackle any questions that come my way when I finish. Um, but first, and the topic that I'm probably asked about most, um, is Brexit. And Often, um, you know, people always ask, well, you know, the, the vote was seen as a bit of a surprise. It did come as a surprise. Most people thought that the result would be a remain. Um, and, of course, there were multiple different reasons for that vote. But one way that I often try and explain it and describe it in New Zealand and to New Zealanders is by virtue of, of our history um, and the way in which we joined the European Union or the EEC in 1973. So for most European, continental European countries, their path into the European Union was also their path to democratization, out of conflict or totalitarianism. Um, and for us, it wasn't that. For us, it was a far more economic decision um, and very much weighing up, well, actually, this is probably in our best interest economically to join. But it wasn't as much of an identity thing as I think the European Union is for many Europeans, you know, this new vida, the never again from those that have come out of, of conflict and, 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 and um, totalitarianism. And so I think that's partly why, because the membership was not an identity thing for many Brits, the sovereignty sacrifice that comes with being a member of the European Union perhaps didn't sit quite so well with many Brits. And you know, it is quite a significant sovereignty sacrifice, and one that I would argue New Zealanders wouldn't accept. To not be able to do your own um, trade policy, to have the final court of appeal not in your own country, there are very, it does take quite a big sovereignty sacrifice. So I think for some people, and I'm not saying this is the only answer, some people that didn't sit well, and I think it is part of the picture. Um, but where are we now? Well, it obviously, and it, you don't need me to tell you this, uh, remains a very divisive issue. Uh, but what is clear is that the government is committed to respecting the results of the referendum. And although it is very noisy and often seems quite messy and there's a lot of debate, we've actually made gradual, significant progress in the negotiations. And I'll, I'll run through those um, briefly. Um, so, so first of all, we of course triggered Article 50 in March 2017, that of course started the negotiations of our departure. Um, in March um, this year, 2018, we actually made quite a lot of progress across a lot of um, fronts. It was, we, we finalised the agreement on the divorce bill, which is around um, 40 billion. Um, but that is, you know, that is actually just the UK committing to um, maintain its existing financial contributions. We agreed on the rights of EU nationals and Brits in, in European Union countries. Um, we agreed a backstop arrangement for the, for the border in, in Ireland. And perhaps most significantly, we agreed on what's called an implementation period or a transitional period. Um, which 
starts when we Brexit on 29th of March next year and goes through till December 2020. And that implementation period essentially provides quite a lot of continuity, which is very important for businesses with business confidence. It provides continuity in terms of our membership of the single market, our membership of the customs union, continued application of ECJ jurisdiction. Um, but and there are almost the most significant difference is that in that period we will have the scope to negotiate and agree our own um, trade agreements. And that's very, very significant in the, in the New Zealand context, and I will come back to that. Um, so then, um, what next? In July, there was the, the Chequers Agreement. So uh, all of Cabinet met at the Prime Minister's country home, Chequers, and, um, and, and agreed on an outline for our negotiating position, what we're trying to achieve. Um, as an end state arrangement with the European Union. Um, and that, that was translated into a white paper which sets out what we want to see in terms of security cooperation, what we want to see in terms of the future economic partnership, and it also outlines a um, facilitated customs arrangement and common rule book that would enable trading goods to be as frictionless as possible, but would also enable us to do our own trade deals. Now, um, that of course is also not without its bumps and, and noises, and we had two resignations, but actually what we have now is a government united behind this position, um, and a an government united and focused on proceeding at pace with negotiations with the EU. Um, and those negotiations are continuing, and the key date coming up is the October European Council, um, where we're going to need to have reached agreement both on the exact terms of the withdrawal but also agreement on the future relationship and how that works. Now that's a challenging timetable um, and there are difficult things to be resolved, particularly um, the Northern Ireland border but also the exact details of the facilitated customs arrangement. Um, so, so that's in a way the process. Um, let me talk a little bit about the UK in Europe um, and the relationship and how it is changing. Um, and you know, again, of course, it is noisy, it is, it, it is quite tense, I would say, um, because particularly in a negotiation, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed and the volume always turns up um, a lot toward, when, as you get into the end game. But despite all that, despite all the reporting in the media, I think it's really important to always remember and reiterate that our European partners are our closest allies and neighbours. And we are incredibly closely aligned. We have been for a long time and will continue to be. We're aligned economically, but also on our core values, you know, our Weltanschauung, how we see the world, our respect for democracy, rule of law, um, the importance of tackling climate change, the importance of a rules-based international order. That list of, of commonality and shared interests goes on, which is why it's always really important to be clear that while we're leaving the European Union and its institutions, we're not leaving Europe. And as our Prime Minister Theresa May said earlier this year, we should not think about leaving the European Union as marking an ending as much as marking a new beginning for the United Kingdom and our relationship with our European allies. She has also been clear, and I quote, um, that Europe's security is our security. The United Kingdom is unconditionally committed to maintaining it. And I'm confident, um, even though this is a lot of oxygen, I'm confident, the government is confident, that we will come to an agreement that is based on these values and commitments, and that works not just for our economies, because we are so intertwined economically, but for our people too. Uh, because frankly, there's too much at stake for that, for it not to work. 